Well, welcome to the Keeping It Israel podcast. My name is Jeff, and uh, I'm your host today. And my guest today is Gidon Ariel. Uh, Gidon is the founder and CEO of Root Source, an organization dedicated to promoting respectful relationships between Christians and Jews. Root Source brings knowledgeable Israeli teachers and curious Christians together to study the Jewish texts and concepts that are foundational to their faith. Gidon made Aliyah from Queens, New York when he was 14. He lives in Ma'al Hever, a suburb of Hebron in the West Bank, where he moved with his family in 2012. Gidon, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. Just want to start with some background. You know, tell us a little bit about your journey from your childhood home in Queens to making Aliyah to where you now live uh, near the city of Hebron. I'm just kind of curious, you know, about a Jew Jewish family picking up and, and making Aliyah to Israel. I love these stories. Okay, so what happened was I was born in Queens, New York. You know, New York is the second biggest Jewish state in the world. <laughs> And, uh, so I was, so I was, I was growing up in a Jewish community, but uh, I wasn't uh, very orthodox, very, um, uh, I wasn't very observant of uh, the Jewish religion, but I was part of an orthodox Jewish community, and that means that I went to an orthodox Jewish uh, synagogue, and I also went to an orthodox Jewish day school. If I'll uh, help, perhaps some of your listeners. Uh, in general, there are three main uh, uh, th uh, streams in uh, modern Judaism. They are Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. So Orthodox is basically the most traditional that follows uh, pretty much the same kind of Judaism that your great-great-great-grandfather followed. And uh, Reform, on the other end, says, listen, we got a brand new modern era, and all of that stuff goes out the window, and we're just going to be Jewish because that's what we feel like we got to be. And then there's conservative, which is in between. Compared to reform, it's conservative. Compared to orthodox, it's reform. And that is uh, pretty much uh, the way uh, modern, especially in, um, American Judaism is today. There are some outliers. There's a thing called uh, Reconstructionist. There's something called New Age, that kind of thing. But in principle, you've got the... the and, and the, the, of course, it's the biggest stream of uh, Judaism today in the United States, states, which is unaffiliated. <laughs> and uh, that, that is really what most Jews are today. That's helpful. Very interesting. Anyway, I was growing up a, uh, a, a nominally uh, Orthodox Jew, which means that I really behaved and, um, and made sure that I fulfilled the commandments probably as much as a reform or an unaffiliated Jew. But I was affiliated, my family was affiliated with an Orthodox synagogue and an Orthodox day school. That is until uh, fifth grade when my parents decided to take me out of that Orthodox day school and put me into the local public school. Now, as far as being involved with uh, other a unaffiliated Jews, you see, even in that Orthodox day school in my uh, back in when I was uh, 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 an, an elementary schoolboy, uh, there weren't most of my friends in school, and in fact, most of my friends in the synagogue, even though they were Orthodox institutions, we were we were barely uh, affiliated with that. It was just a place to go. Listen, we were all of ten or, or eleven years old. But when my parents took me out of the uh, Jewish day school and put me into the public school, I said, pretty much like uh, what uh, uh, an old singer said, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And I decided then in fifth grade that I wanted to be a more identified, a more identifying Jew. And so I, as we say in Yiddish, hacked my parents a chinik. I hit them over the head for an entire year until they let me go back to the Jewish day school in sixth grade. <laughs> And uh, that's and and then I decided to make it much more make take it much more seriously, and I was very lucky in that fifth grade that I was introduced to a Jewish Zionist Orthodox youth movement. It was called Bnei Akiva, and in that youth movement, I discovered the five loves of my life. They are the love of the God of Israel, 
the love of the people of Israel, the love of the Torah of Israel, Torah, of course, meaning the Bible and a few other things that maybe we'll talk about today, um, the love of the land of Israel and the love of the state of Israel. And uh, with so much love going around, I was just loving it. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting that you uh, outline those five things, because as I'm listening to your list, uh, you know, as a as a Christian believer, I, too, share those loves. And um, I think that's uh, I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And I've been and every time I say this to a Christian group, I say you all love the same things, don't you? It's true. It's true. Now, I won't say it's true exclusively, uh, you know, of, of every Christian believer, uh, but certainly where, where I'm coming from. Absolutely. Now, you, you transition from from being a, you know, 14 year old kid in Hebrew day school. And, and now you you're making Aliyah to Israel with your parents. Um, what sort of changes happen as a result of that and uh, how does that how does that alter the trajectory of your life uh, i think you better go and read your uh, your crypt notes over there because nowhere does it say that i moved to israel with my parents oh i just assumed that uh you did a 14 a 14 year old isn't going to just pick up out of his house and move halfway across the road the world so help me out with this then. Uh, correct me. Well, that, 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 yeah, that's a good assumption. But uh, when you're talking with Gideon Ariel, you got to break. You got to leave all your assumptions aside and leave nothing to assume. <laughs> when I when I uh, when I uh, went from that day school to a uh, Orthodox Jewish high school, it wasn't as good a high school as it was the day school. I was in ninth grade in that high school, and it wasn't so very good. So my parents and I decided that we would sit down and we would discuss what I would do for 10th grade. So my parents saw that I was spending most of my life for, the, for that year and the previous two years since I got involved with that B'nai Akiva youth movement at the youth movement clubhouse. I was, I was barely going to school as it were. I was barely coming home. I was most of the mm -hmm. time at the clubhouse. So knowing about Zionism and nothing, knowing about Israel as they did, um, they said, hey, Gidon, would you consider going to Israel for the rest of high school? And I jumped at the chance. Wow. You see, I had been, I had been used to going to uh, summer camp, this B'nai Akiva summer camp, and I just loved it. My parents saw that if I could have summer camp for 12 months a year, then I would love it even more. Hmm. And so they figured this B'nai Akiva Zionist youth movement summer camp was trying to recreate the Israel experience. So they figured, let's try to send them to Israel and see what happens. Wow. Now, you, you will have to forgive me for the assumption because uh, not very many parents would send their 14 year old kid halfway around the world, uh, especially for 12 months out of the year. But uh, so so this is this is unique, I would say, in many in many ways. Um, so now, nowadays, as a 14 now, nowadays, parents barely send their kids halfway around the block without a play date, not without a cell phone, <laughs> exactly. yeah, not without a cell phone. That's for sure. But uh, yeah, no, listen, so th this is very intriguing to me. So you, you go to Israel as a 14 year old. What was the uh, the high school that you went to uh, a boarding type situation? Is that what we're looking at? Exactly. If I if I can say a little uh, story, my father was born in Hungary uh, in okay. Europe and uh, he was born in 1930. So uh, you can you can put the dots together and figure out that he is a, a survivor of the Holocaust, and mm -hmm. uh, he, he uh, thankfully survived. And actually, he was a member of this B'nai Akiva youth movement. Just well, not just like I was. He was a member of the branch in Hungary during and before the Holocaust, and a little bit after the Holocaust. While I was just a member of of the uh, of this youth movement in New York. A little, a little difference between right. New York in the '70s and uh, Europe in the '40s. Yes, for sure. All right. Well, that's uh, 
Man, that's a whole story in and of itself. I'm sure we could uh, talk a lot about that. But uh, let's move on. You, uh, you, you got to Israel. You did your high school. You served in the army. Um, had a bit of a career there with the tank corps. And uh, but in in 2014, you founded an organization called Root Source. And um, first of all, you know what what motivated you to to found something like this? And tell us a little bit about what Root Source is all about. What's the what's the mission? What's the purpose? What's what's uh, what's the deal with Root Source? With your permission, I'll keep the people online a little bit longer and get to Root Source in a moment. But let me first tell you about my story. While I was in fact in the army, I was in a special program in the army where we studied in yeshiva part time an advanced uh, Jewish studies program, and part-time, we were full-time in the military in the tank corps. So when I was on a uh, furlough from one of those, I don't remember which, I was walking through Jerusalem on a, on, a, a mini, on a micro vacation, and I came upon an apartment building across the street that had a sign on it. So I crossed the street in order to read the sign because that's my hobby. You know, you could get a degree in Jewish history just by reading the street signs in Jerusalem. Interesting. This was not a street sign. It was a sign of an office, and it said on it, I-C-E-J. And I wondered ah. what I-C-J stood for. So I uh, opened the door a little bit, and I noticed that there was the reception area, and uh, there were some brochures. And in fact, it probably had on the door not just the letters ICEJ. If it just said ICJ, that would be enough. But it, it had what those letters stood for. It stood for the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. And this ignited my curiosity. Because how could Christian, we know what Christian means, and how could Israel, which means the Jewish state, or, or Jerusalem, which means the capital of the Jewish state, and in between you have an embassy, which means a friendship. How, since when are Christians friends with Jews? That wasn't something that I, that I knew when I was growing up in New York. Right. And I said, this must be very interesting. So that's why I opened the door, and I saw some brochures, and I picked them up. And when the receptionist said, can I help you? I said, no, 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 just browsing. And I took those brochures home, and I realized that there are Christians who love Israel, who love the Jewish people. And mm -hmm. this was a mind blower for me. And this, I was probably, this was probably uh, the early 80s. Okay. But I kept on looking out for more organizations like this. I returned to the ICEJ to say, to ask them, tell me more about yourself. This just doesn't, it just doesn't compute for me. Because mm. I grew up now, my parents were very liberal, and and uh, they really believed you gotta you gotta be friends with everybody who wants to be friends with you. But we were just coming out of the Holocaust, and when we learned Jewish history in Europe, because we were Jews originally from Europe, my father, as I said, was from Hungary. My mother was uh, she was born in the United States, but her parents were from Russia. So, right. uh, in other words, they weren't from Ethiopia or from uh, Syria. We were used to good old-fashioned European Jewish history, and that's the way it was with the most of the students in my class at that uh, Jewish day school. When we studied the Holocaust, we didn't only study the Holocaust, we studied all of Jewish history, which means that the Christians were trying to kill us for 2,000 years. That's what it meant. Hmm. Now, some of your Christian listeners might say, what are you talking about? I'm a Christian and I love the Jews. Well, I'm telling you the way it was in the 80s and certainly the way that it was in the 40s. All of these loving Christians who loved us all around the world, not a single one of them was in power enough to say, we're a country that will let this boat full of Jews into our land. There was not a single country in the world that would let the Jews in during the Second World War. Not a single one. And that is why there was a Holocaust. And so if you say, I love the Jews, and I would love to be able to save them during the Holocaust, well, that's, as I tell my, fa my kids, that's woulda, shoulda, coulda. If you coulda, then you woulda, but you couldn't. And unfortunately now, there's certainly what we call uh, um, ge uh, 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 righteous Gentiles. 
Gentiles who did save Jews in the Holocaust. And those righteous Gentiles are honored at Yad Vashem, the museum of the, Holo of, of the Holocaust in Jerusalem. You know mm -hmm. how many Jews you had to save in order to be honored as a righteous Gentile in Yad Vashem, Jeff? Take a guess. One? Good guess. How many? Only one Jew you had to be able to save. Yeah. Now, there were some righteous Gentiles who were able to save thousands. Oscar yes. Schindler, um, a, 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 a Yoki Mofo. There were, there were some, but not a lot. So how many, how many Jews were actually saved by the hundreds of, of uh, righteous Gentiles who were recognized by, by uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem? Maybe tens of thousands. But that's tens of thousands out of six million. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that is the way... Jews growing up in the 80s, like me, felt about anybody but Jews. We got nobody. And all we had in America were Jews and Christians. That's what America was in those days. Yeah. And so if you're not Jewish, you're a Christian. And if you're not Jewish, which means that I can count on you if there'll ever be another Holocaust, then you're a Christian and I can't count on you if there's ever another Holocaust. I just got to close the wagons and only people that I can count on are Jews. Until that day, Jeff, when I walked into that office of the International Christian Embassy of Jerusalem. Wow, that's a huge perspective changer for you, but uh, it also adds incredible perspective, I think, for uh, for myself, for others who are listening right now to, to help us understand, to help me understand, to help others understand, uh, you know, exactly where the Jewish people uh, were coming from uh, in their in their attitudes towards Christians. Um, and while I've, you know, got the microphone, uh, let me just apologize on behalf of Christians everywhere for for that unfortunate uh, reality that occurred in history. We certainly, people like myself, would never, ever, ever want to allow anything like that to happen again. And and uh, you know, history is a is a cruel teacher, but uh, we we do we do recognize and realize that uh, those were terrible days, and. Um, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, I love the perspective that you bring. And I love how this sort of, you know, what some people would call random, uh, you know, encounter has has changed, uh, you know, your your outlook on on life. So tell us a little bit about moving from there to the work that you're doing now. So throughout those years, uh, since I was in the army, until I got married, and then a little a few more years after that, um, I was working a little bit in uh, high tech, a little bit of low tech, a little bit all over the place. Listen, before I got married, it was enough to eat a few a few pieces of falafel a day, and that would be enough for me. I didn't need a high tech company to to work <laughs> there. You know what I mean? Yeah. But anyway, when I did get married, then I needed to then I started working in high tech, but it wasn't giving me fulfillment. And I said, here I am, from time to time, I would be invited by a Christian group to, um, to speak to them, to tell them a little bit about my history, to tell them a little bit about the Torah, a little bit about my Judaism. Because, and, and these were groups that were fascinated to hear. Why? Because they realized that if they love Jesus, then they want to learn more about Jesus. And to learn more about Jesus, the best way that they could learn about Jesus is to learn about and from somebody who is like Jesus. And who was Jesus? He was an Orthodox rabbi learning Torah in the land of Israel. So why yeah. don't I try to hear what an Orthodox Jewish rabbi who lives in the land of Israel has to say? Yeah, yeah. And that and that is why not to now now you're you're 
you're nodding and, and smiling, Jeff. But that is a game changer for most Christians also. It's true. Most Christians were, were grow, brought up saying, listen, my church has a, uh, a faith statement, a statement of faith. If I can check you off on every one of those points of that statement of faith, then I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to talk to you and I can be, feel safe with you. Now, if you don't even start off with the number one, the number one point of the statement of faith, which means that I believe in Jesus as the Messiah and God and the Lord, then how can I possibly learn from you? But if people are strong enough in their faith and say, listen, I'm going to listen to somebody who doesn't have the same faith as me, but we're going to try to learn from each other and maybe we'll learn something that will help us get our faith even stronger. And that's what I'm trying to do. When I talk to Christians, I'm not trying to have them break their faith, God forbid. I'm trying to make their faith stronger because mm. the Christians that I talk to are Christians who love Israel. And I believe that a Christian who loves Israel and a Christian who loves the Jews and a Christian who studies the Bible will only love those Jewish people even more. And so if, and, and so if I can help them to be a better Christian, a better Bible-believing Christian, that's in my interest. That's the way I see it. But again, not to turn them into anything but a better Christian in their own eyes. That's great. That's good. So that is what uh, this this organization, that's what Root Source is all about. Now, you know, how how do you accomplish that? What's sort of the day to day of uh, of the organization? And, and uh, talk to us a little bit about that. I'll tell you, I'd been doing this for a few years, going to different organizations like the ICJ that I mentioned, Bridges for Peace in Jerusalem, Christians United for Israel, Christians for Israel. And uh, whenever I would uh, uh, knock on the door loud enough, they'd say, okay, come on, get on, talk to our group over here. <laughs> so I would have about uh, two or three lectures like this a year. And that wasn't enough. I said, wait a second, there's such a thing called the Internet. Maybe I will be able to find people from all over the world that want to listen to me. Maybe I'll, you know, I'll charge them 10 bucks an hour or something like that. I'll be able to teach a, 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 a class. And maybe I'll even be able to make a living out of this. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I introduced this idea to a group that I was talking to the next day. Uh, I'll mention the leader of that group, my friend Christine Darg. Uh, she's got an, uh, a ministry called Exploits Ministry. I think it's exploits.tv. And uh, I told her and her group on the walls of Jerusalem where I was speaking, I want to establish an online yeshiva for Christians. And... A, a, a simple gasp came up from the whole group. <laughs> Hallelujah. And one of those uh, people in that group came up to me and said, I want to be your first student. And he ended up being my friend Bob O'Dell from Austin, Texas. And uh, make a longer story short, we basically decided to build this program on the web. And uh, I recruited about a half dozen friends of mine to be teachers and little by little we th my teachers recorded more and more lessons we had to do it by recording because I can't teach people in the Philippines and in California at the same time and not be awake 24 hours a day right so in order to in order to let my teachers feel a little bit more normal I told them record some lessons put them up on a topic that you're interested in Jewish history uh, Hebrew for beginners uh, women in the Bible, Jewish prayer, uh, uh, M Moses, a, uh, uh, a profile of a leader. These were some of the topics that my teachers started teaching. And thank God, over the years, we've recorded over a thousand lessons, each one between 15 and 20 and, and 40 minutes long. And over... 50,000 Christians all over the world have been subscribing to our free newsletter. And wow. that is what Root Source is all about. That's phenomenal. Well, 
I uh, I applaud that effort, and uh, I'm I'm super intrigued. I want to ask, you know, as you as you sort of begin to sort of work this out, what are you, uh, you know, what are you learning? What what are some of the perspectives, uh, the the misconceptions that a Jews have about Christians and B Christians have about Jews. I don't know how long it'll take to talk about that, but, but what are some of those misconceptions and how can we navigate those? Well, well, the easy part is what are the, what are the misconceptions that Jews have about Christians? I've already mentioned them. The misconception that Jews have about Christians that all Jew Christians want to do is either kill us or convert us. And I've already learned that there are plenty of Christians who are saying, listen, if there is a big, a, a great commission to bring the God of Israel to the people of the world, well, some Christians realize, hey, there are some Jews who already have the God of Israel. And frankly, they've been holding on to it for the past 4,000 years. Hmm. So far be it from me to try to uh, convert a Jew, he's already got God. He's already got the God of Israel. And if he hasn't got Jesus, well, listen, says a Christian, how did I become a believer in Jesus? Jesus himself appeared unto me. I got to Jesus because J Jesus himself introduced himself to me. So am I going to be able to convince this rabbi of Jesus just by saying, hey, why don't you look at Isaiah 53? 53, that should do the trick for you. No, it's not a trick. Hmm. And so these people have realized that at this point in their lives, they are not to look at Gidon and the other teachers of root source, and frankly, maybe all Jews, as a target for a uh, conversion. They are to look at them as a person, somebody to build a bridge of friendship of with and that is what God really wants. Now that's something that, that Christians have to come to terms with. And it's something right. that Jews have to come to terms with. Because all of these, both of these, bo members of both of these faith communities were too busy realizing that for the past 2,000 years, things weren't going too well for this relationship. Now, have you, have you seen the, uh, Fiddler on the, the movie Fiddler on the Roof? I have. Okay, so... What was going on? The Jews were, were hanging out on the Jewish side, and any time they had to deal with a Christian, with a non-Jew, and who are the non-Jews in Europe? It, it wasn't uh, Buddhists, and, and it right. wasn't... Um, the, it, they were Christians. Now, you can say, well, those weren't my kind of Christians. We Jews, at first, we say, listen, you got me a Christian. If you're a Christian, then that's the Christian that I'm identifying you with. The ones that that did the, 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 um, the Crusades, the one that did the pogroms. No, thank you. So yeah. that is a misconception that Jews have to overcome. That, right. And that is what I'm trying to teach Jews also. The Christians that I'm friendly with yeah. aren't your great-great-grandfather's Christians. This yeah. is something new that God is bringing into the world for the Jews and the Christians and really the entire world. Because I believe that God is bringing history to a climax. And that climax must be that all the people of the world will be loving each other and loving God. Those are the two commandments that, God, that Jesus said. And frankly, you know where he got them from. They're two of the commandments. They're the two main commandments that Jewish people who even those who don't follow Jesus still believe are the number one commandments. Right, yeah. So those are the toughest commandments also. But I believe that God is making it a little bit easier for us. And that is what I, in my little ability, I'm trying to build those bridges for. That there will be more Jews who are open to Christians and more Christians who are open to Jews. 
It's good. Now, when when we read, uh, you know, what we call the Bible, and when you when you read the Bible, uh, there's some obvious. There's one real big obvious difference. But but talk to me about about how Christians understand the Bible and and what they're missing uh, often. And and this is a little bit of my pet peeve sometimes too. You know what it is they're missing when they when they read the text. Well, I'll tell you. What you said, what we call the Bible, what you call the Bible is what, what people often call the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament is what we Jews call the Bible. Eh, there are, right. uh, sometimes it's, it's books are in a different order. Maybe there's a, a different counting of the verses. But 99.9% .9 of what I call the Tanakh, the Bible, the, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings is identical to what uh, uh, um, Christians call the Old Testament. Then right. we're left with the New Testament. And the New Testament includes many, 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 many quotes from the Bible, i.e. the Old Testament, which means when Jesus walked the earth and when his disciples walked the earth and wrote the New Testament, when they said the Bible, what were they talking about? They were talking, they were about, talking the Tanakh. about the Tanakh. The yes. Old Testament. But nowadays, too many Christians, mostly not the Christians that I talk with, but the ones that said something is uncomfortable, the ones that haven't yet said something's not right over here, all they're reading is the New Testament. Yeah. And the only reason they're reading it is because it's the life and times of Jesus Christ. And that's good enough for them. <laughs> yeah. And they don't realize that if you really want to understand Jesus You've got to read the books that he read. You've got to watch the TV programs that Jesus watched. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he didn't. in other words, if I want, if I'm courting a beautiful woman, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the, 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 I'll give you the, 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 the secret, the, 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 um, the spoiler. I married her. <laughs> but when I, when I courted her, I wanted to learn what interested her. I wanted to learn about her. Yeah. So when, if you really want to love Jesus, then it's not enough just to to read about Jesus. You got to read about what Jesus read about. It's not yeah. enough to love Jesus. You got to want to love what Jesus loved. That's good. That's really really good. One of my other issues sometimes is that that if. Christians do read the Old Testament. Um, they read it as though it's all about them. Uh, talk to me just a little bit about that. Okay, some Christians um, ha uh, are unfortunately f f fallers of prey of what is called uh, replacement theology. And that basically yeah. means that God in the uh, Old Testament and in the New Testament promises great promises to Israel however we saw that Israel didn't do, do uh, such a good job I like to say that the New Testament is the book as I mentioned before the life and times of Jesus and the Old Testament is the book of the life and times of the people of Israel uh, during the uh, uh, time of the Old Testament of course you know you're not gonna have yeah. their uh, uh, a story about the, the the 1920s we're talking about up until the end of the Old Testament which is basically the time of the of the 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 patriarchs the three patriarchs and the matriarchs which is Abraham Isaac and Jacob then you also have Joseph and a few uh, more generations so you get to Moses when he was in the he and the entire people of Israel were in the uh, uh, Egypt uh, as slaves mm -hmm. then they left Egypt uh, and they left slavery. They moved to the land of Israel under the leadership of Joshua. And then for a few hundred years, they were under the leaderships of the judges. And then for a few more hundred years, they were under the leaderships of the kings. And that's it. I just told you the entire uh, story, history line of the Old Testament in about uh, 10 seconds. The only and so that is the story of the of the Jewish people. I, I use the word Jewish right. people in Israel interchangeably, even though it's an anachronism in the Bible times. The only problem is is that it's really the story of the Jewish people during the Bible times, 
and how badly they messed up. <laughs> Which is crazy, but it's true. Because if we look into the Bible, most of the time it wasn't so good. We're talking about maybe two weeks when, the, mm. when the Solomon built the temple and the temple was okay before Solomon went and started worshiping idols again. And and he, he and uh, then his son Re Rehabam. I don't know how you say it in English. Rehabam. And there was he had a, uh, uh, a, a a a a friend who wasn't much of a friend who said, "No, you're not the king. I'm the king. I'm Yerovam, Jeroboam, maybe." And that was it. From then on, the rest of the Bible, 410 years, there was a split between the, the uh, of uh, between the northern king. Kitzer, it was terrible. The Bible, mm. while, the, while the New Testament talks about how great Jesus was, understandably, the Old Testament tells how rotten the Jewish people were, <laughs> how they couldn't <laughs> get their act together. <laughs> now, that, so, so, it's, so it's a whole different, different perspective sure on is. life. Yeah. It's yeah. saying all you got to do is believe in this perfect Jesus. I'm not going to say this perfect person. <laughs> This perfect Jesus, and you'll be fine. So that's a very optimistic perspective. On the other hand, you got the Jewish people who are saying, all you got to do is fix all the garbage that all your your um, uh, anti your precedents, uh, all your patriarchs and matriarchs messed up. That sounds mm. pretty negative. However, however, you'll see that it's the opposite, because. The fact that we're still around means that God still loves us and is still giving us a chance to fix it up. Yeah. While the, while the, um, the uh, Christians, they say, listen, if I don't believe in, G in Jesus, I'm destined to hell. So I, I better believe in Jesus. <laughs> what about if you're not pure in your belief? What happens if those... 49,999 different Christianities with their different statements of faith. Maybe one of them is right. Maybe you're not right. Whoa. Then maybe I'm destined for hell? That's pretty. That's that. You know, when people are smiling and everything's good, but when you think about it a little bit, it's pretty desperate. It's not so good. So I'm not saying that, that you should give up on your belief. Keep it. But I, all I'm saying is that if you look, if you put your, if a Christian puts himself, a, a Christian who believes in replacement theology, which means that God threw away the Jewish people and now all he wants is people to believe in Jesus, well, hmm. take a look at us, see how good we're doing in Israel, see how good we are re, uh, regathering the exiles and other wondrous prophecies that are coming true in our lifetime and say, well, for A, Maybe God hasn't given up on the Jews, even though they don't believe in Jesus. And B, maybe what God wrote in Genesis 12, 3, that if I bless you, i.e., the, uh, the people who came from Abraham, the Jewish people, if I bless the Jews, if, if I, as a Christian, if God is saying to everybody else, if you, Christians, and anybody else in the world, bless the Jews and love the Jews, then you will be blessed and loved. And the other side of the coin, I'll leave it for you to uh, look up Genesis 12, 3b. But, uh, and I'm <laughs> finding that God is putting into the hearts of thousands and hundreds of thousands yeah. and millions of Christians just exactly that. Yeah, And that's so right. there are many Christians who still don't have it in their hearts. God hasn't chosen to ignite their hearts with, with this greatest story of the 21st and 20th century. But he's putting it into the hearts of so many Christians to say, we love God. We love God's people. How did I say in the beginning? We love the God of Israel. We love the people of Israel. We love the land of Israel. Yeah, that's right. And that is what is God is putting into hearts of the Christians. When my Jewish friends ask me, what's the deal with these Christians? I say they love the Jewish people. Mostly, bottom line, is because God told them to. That's the way it works.
that is the way it works and that's the way it works for christians i believe when they're when they're approaching it correctly <laughs> when they're thinking about it properly and uh i appreciate the insight it's very very good hey listen gidon i want to this has been a great uh, a great chat together and um, i want to ask you one more question because uh our producer laura uh, told me that you made kind of a passing comment in one of your conversations with her and so here's the big question if you could travel back in time through history in israel which year would you head for and why Okay, before I answer your question, I'd just like to reach out to your listeners and watchers and say that just like you and I, Jeff, we're having a conversation, I love to have conversations. You don't need to have an audience on a, on a blog or on a podcast. Please just contact me through contact us at rootthersource.com or just send me an email at gidon at rootthersource.com and I'd love to engage with you. Tell me that you heard about me on uh, Jeff Futter's program, Keeping It Israel. And by interacting with me, you'll be able to keep it Israel even more. Yeah, there you go. Your, your question was, what year would I like to go back? And I actually did this exercise once. And I don't know too much exactly, exactly the year, but I'll tell you which period. And the period that I would like to go back is the period towards the end of uh, Jesus' life, about 30 A.D., as they say. And that is because from obviously from a christian perspective that is a fascinating time <laughs> could it be more fascinating to uh be there when the object of your <laughs> love and your faith is right there in front of you and you could touch the hem of his garment C can't imagine that as a christian exactly but i as a jew would love to go back to that time and why is that because jesus was a controversial Jewish leader at that time and I would love to challenge myself to go back to that time and wonder which side yeah. I would be on hmm. it's, it's easy for a Jew in the 20th century to say what are you talking about Jesus the worst enemy of the Jewish people he was terrible blah 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 but from what I've yeah. seen from my Christian friends who are doing a great Kiddush Hashem, who are sanctifying God's name in how much they love the God of Israel and how much they love yeah. each other, how much they are following those two, ca those two uh, commandments. When I meet somebody like you, Jeff, I'm saying, how could Jesus be all that bad if he's got such wonderful followers? And so I uh, say, I want to go back. I want to go back now. I would love to. I, I could call my bluff. It ain't happening so fast. But if I could go back <laughs> and see the real story, not the story yeah. rewritten by the Jewish people over thousands of years who had nothing to go on for about Jesus except what they saw that their followers were doing over those thousands of years. We've already established hmm. how bad... A, uh, a Christian those Christians were for those thousands of years because all they could do to the G to the Jews was kill them or or uh, or uh, or burn their synagogues or who knows what no thanks but now I have been introduced to the real Jesus by his followers and I'm not afraid of Jesus anymore I would love to be able now I haven't already met him <laughs> don't yeah. don't say wow this kid on he's one step away from being a believer in Jesus no 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 I'm plenty away I I need I need a time machine and even then I'm not sure because how many sure. followers did Jesus have amongst Christian amongst Jews there were no Christians in his days there was only Jews thousands tens of thousands how many Jews were there then millions yeah. Most Jews, as you know, as it says in the in the in the New Testament, most Jews didn't follow Jesus, but some did, and I would love to be able to challenge myself for that, not only because of that, but because also that time was such a fascinating time for Jewish history. You've heard of the yeah, Essenes, for sure. you've heard of yes. the Pharisees, you've heard you've heard of the Sadducees. Well, the, those were all Jews. And I would yes. love to go back there, even though 
I probably would have got killed because there was a lot of civil war going on at the time. <laughs> and ultimately, the <laughs> temple was destroyed because of the hatred between Jewish sects. But that was the most fascinating time in Jewish history and in Christian history. Well, that is uh, that's fantastic. And um, I, I want to say thank you so much for taking time with us today and uh, for being on the show. Wonderful to, to hear about the, the incredible friendship that's that's developing, has been developing over a number of years between Christians and Jews. And uh, to hear that, you know, ICEJ was one of the, the catalysts that brought you to, to where you are in terms of this relationship. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing with Root Source. I think this is phenomenal. And I look forward to connecting with you in, uh, in Jerusalem or, or where you live. Uh, you're near Hebron, I think. But, uh, uh, you know, connecting with you when, when we're back over there, we're hoping to be there in September. And uh, it would just be great to, to connect and, and um, share a little bit more. So thanks for being on the show. Okay, I'm 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 committing you to that. When you come to Israel, you're not going to leave before we shake hands. I listen. I'm good to go. We'll we'll make sure Laura sets it up. And 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 uh, I hope that we will be able to meet again. Whether or not uh, we meet in Jerusalem quickly, uh, speedily in our days, l'shana habab yushalayim, as we say in Hebrew. But let's have mm -hmm. another one of these podcasts. Uh, we've only just uh, scratched the surface. And I'm looking forward to in, in inviting you and interviewing you on Root Source interviews as well. Hey, that'd be fantastic. I'd love to I'd love to do it. I'd have to do some homework, I think, and prepare a little bit. But uh, anyway, <laughs> great to meet you, Gidon. God bless. Amen. Shalom, shalom. Israel. That meaningful name is mentioned more than 2,300 times in the Bible. It is from this land, nation, and people that Christianity emerged some 2,000 years ago. But since that time, Christianity has become mostly disconnected from Israel. And without an understanding of the Jewishness of Jesus and our Hebraic foundations, so much of the depth and meaning of the Bible is lost. First Century Foundations is committed to helping Christians reconnect and stay connected to Israel. We invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can view our TV programs and weekly video podcasts, Keeping It Israel. Follow us on Facebook and our other social media platforms. Let's reconnect to Israel and stay connected. Find out more at firstcenturyfoundations.com.